Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Back to Choir, Positive and Practical Next Steps. My name is Sam Allchurch, and I'm delighted to be your host this evening. This is the second uh, webinar that Gondwana Choirs is pleased to present, uh, looking at issues surrounding choral singing and COVID-19. We're delighted to be joined by about 700 people from across Australia, from every state and territory in Australia, and from many, many countries around the world. Um, all sorts of, uh, almost all continents represented. So welcome, it's great to have you with us. And we hope you'll find tonight uh, helpful and inspiring. The point of this evening's discussion is really to consider um, and provide some ideas and some inspiration uh, for the next steps in choral singing uh, and to give every one of us uh, ideas to plan how we will transition to rehearse, rehearsing and possibly performing in the future. We know that this is a, a case that varies dramatically based on where you are, which state or territory in Australia that is, and that's not what we'll be addressing tonight. Uh, we'll be, whenever it is appropriate for you to come back to singing, here's how you might go about it. Uh, this time next week, we're delighted also to launch our International Choral Insights series, uh, a set of discussions with leading choral practitioners from around Australia and around the world as well. We begin our series with the wonderful Simon Halsey, one of the world's great choral conductors, uh, and he'll be uh, speaking to us all about how he inspires his choirs. So you can sign up for that for the bargain price of $15 at the Gondwana website. In this evening's discussion, we're going to uh, just outline the sort of structure so you know where we're going and what we're going to be covering. We'll start with a summary of last week's webinar and then look at some of the ways that our choirs have been working online. We'll then move to the practical considerations of returning to physical rehearsals and performances. Um, and then look at the mental health and social implications that would go with that. And finally, we'll put this all together into how you would develop, how you might go about developing a risk management or a risk minimization strategy. But now it's my great pleasure to introduce our panel this evening. We have artistic director and founder of Gondwana Choirs, Lynn Williams. From Brisbane, we have Paul Holly who's the Associate Director of Voices of Birali, as well as one of our um, wonderful conductors, conducts of Gondwana Chorale with our organisation. Uh, also uh, in Sydney, we have Brett Waymark, Artistic and Music Director of the Sydney Philharmonia Choirs. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Megan Carusi, the Senior Lecturer in Psychiatry Education at UNSW and another member of the Gondwana family with Megan's children having been and still part of Gondwana Choirs. Uh, Dr. Wei Zhang is a doctor and musician and a wonderful member of Sydney Chamber Choir. Uh, and she joins us, uh, I think from Orange um, at the moment in her very hygienic looking studio, excellent. Uh, and we're especially pleased to uh, add a, a new guest to our panel, uh, Dr. Melanie Roth. Uh, Dr. Roth is a geriatrician working at RPA Hospital in Sydney and is the first Chief Clinical Advisor to the Federal Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. Uh, also particularly relevant uh, to tonight's discussion, Dr. Roth has been involved in the consultation around regulations uh, in the aged care context of COVID-19. Uh, she's also a much loved member of the Gondwana family, having had six children go through the choirs as choristers and having traveled with our choirs uh, as a tour doctor and supervisor on many international tours. I think Mel knows more than anyone about chorister medical issues. Um, so in tonight's discussion, you'll be able to uh, ask questions of the panel using the question and answer facility um, through this Zoom webinar. If we can ask you please to uh, use that only for questions to the panel and not for uh, interactive chats um, between members of the audience, that would be great. That'll help our team. Uh, make sure questions are answered swiftly. And it's also great to have received some questions in advance from members attending tonight. So we'll hope to address as many of those as we can. So it's probably a good um, 
place to start to provide some context. I might ask Dr. Wei Zhang to start uh, and provide a summary of last week's webinar. Thank you, Sam. And I'll just again preface what I will say with uh, the fact that we are approaching this from an Australian context uh, with, within Australia. So in a nutshell, compared to the rest of the world, Australia has so far managed to control rates of infection well, while also steadily increasing testing rates and testing capabilities. This means that there are enough tests available for those who need them and our health system has not been overwhelmed with cases. What this means in a practical sense is that compared with areas of the world with much higher prevalence of COVID-19, such as the United States and parts of Europe, a room full of people in Australia has a significantly less chance of containing um, a COVID-19 positive person who can then spread the disease. However, with most of the community in Australia immunologically naive to the virus and without a vaccine to safely confer this immunity, we're still vulnerable to spread until such a vaccine can be found. So there's a huge cooperative effort worldwide to, de to, to deliver such a vaccine, but estimates still have us needing to be prepared for a 12 to 18 month wait. What we do know is that the virus is transmitted through both larger droplets being expelled through the mouth and upper respiratory tract, as well as aerosols or smaller droplets that are exhaled from the lower respiratory tract. Also, there is spread from evaporation and dispersion of larger droplets from surfaces sometime after they're made. Social distancing measurements are based on the vapour and air fluidics of this. And we saw last week a video demonstrating how singing causes significant expulsion of droplet particles. We don't have rigorous scientific studies to determine how much more likely uh, coral singing is to spread COVID-19 than other activities. And in the current context of a pandemic, such a controlled study is not possible because it's just not ethical. Uh, therefore, no official set of regulations exist on this topic. However, if we look at the relaxation of social distancing rules in general, um, we can see that it's based on the idea that in a society with generally low prevalence rates and good transmission control, we can do sensible and practical things to mitigate risk in all of our activities, um, including choral singing, and that is why it's important, particularly at this time, that we're meeting to have this particular conversation. Great, thank you very much, Wei. That's a really helpful summary to provide uh, the context for this evening's discussion. Uh, but before we turn to how we might um, uh, go back to choir rehearsals in physical spaces um, and possibly even performances, uh, this pandemic has triggered a great activity uh, online for choirs. And Lena, I might turn to you. Uh, if you could tell us a bit about how Gondwana's adapted to the online choral space. What have, what, what have you been doing with Gondwana? Thank you, Sam. And I think like everybody, Gondwana has adapted really fast because actually nobody had a choice. Like the rest of the world, we've just had to adapt very, very fast. Um, I think all of us, probably everybody listening to this webinar tonight, realised pretty quickly that actually rehearsing online was going to be really challenging um, because of all the obvious things with the delay and the various difficulties with people's internet and things. The only thing that we're doing which most closely resembles rehearsal is with our group Malia in Cairns who sings Spinifex Gum. So uh, Felix Rebel has been writing new songs for us uh, so that when we come out at the other end, we can actually record a new album. So I have been rehearsing those songs with the girls. But rather than just having them singing all by themselves in a room, which is incredibly lonely, especially when you're surrounded by perhaps all sorts of distractions with family and things around. Uh, one of the members of the choir has actually recorded the tracks with the backing. So we use those in rehearsal. And I've heard a lot of people say that to rehearse using a recording makes singers feel less musically lonely than they otherwise might. 
With our other Gondwana programs, it, I felt that um, it was really important kids growing up through this pandemic, I mean, that happens once every 100 years, they're going to be really marked by having grown up through this extraordinary time. And it's a scary time for us all. And I don't doubt that it's scary for young people. And I really wanted to give them something special, something they don't normally get and something that's actually a treat for this time. So we developed a whole series of elective courses. So for our little ones, our sort of year ones and twos and threes, we've got, you know, homemade percussion and we've got um, sort of crazy songs and songs from the movies. And we're going up, you know, a little bit later and we have um, some beautiful classical duets and solos and we have beatboxing. And then, for you know, our older ones are doing composition. They're doing conducting. And I'm scared that they're all going to be ready to take over by the time the 10 weeks are up. They're don't, doing so incredibly well. Um, they're doing historically informed performance practice. And I just think all of these things, that there are more, are uh, something different. They don't normally get it. So it's a, it's a real treat and it's something to take away that they can remember forever as something that was a really good thing to come out of the time. And we're doing that for Sydney Children's Choir and we're also doing it for our national choirs. In fact, any young people across Australia that want to join those classes. So that's pretty much how we've responded. Super proud of the Gondwana team for getting it all up and going. And um, uh, hopefully though, it, we won't have to draw it out for too, too long because they'll learn too much. But they're saying that when they come back, they'll, they've been telling me themselves that they will have this greater breadth of knowledge. They'll have new levels of musicianship that they can bring back into their rehearsals. So can't ask for more than that. So thank you. So, Brett, um, at Sydney Philharmonia Choirs, you have a wide, wide range of choristers uh, in ages and all sorts of different configurations of choirs. What have you been doing online? Well, it's true. We've got probably over 500 singers that we're trying to cater to. And actually, if you start thinking about some of our big choirs who come together only once a year, like Chorus Oz or indeed the Christmas Choir, we've got well and truly over a 1,000 singers. So we were just about to go uh, into a piano dress rehearsal with Donald Runnicles on Beethoven, Mrs. Solemnus, when this happened to us and the, the, the restrictions on gatherings happened. We are, of course, in the middle of our 100th anniversary year, so it's one of the most unusual years for the Philharmonia, and we, are, we have actually been approached by a documentary film company to actually have a look at that, because it's possibly going to be one of the most unusual years we've ever had, one which we hope not to repeat um, in, the, in the near future. But one of the things that we did do for this year was to commission 100 minutes of new music, and that was everything from a commission with Brett Dean that would have been premiered in Birmingham later this year, through to asking members of our choirs uh, to, to compose for us. So a lot of our thinking has been around trying to maintain that momentum around the 100th anniversary and indeed to honour the compositional uh, work that we did to sort of make this year happen. So basically we do very simple things. We uh, send out a weekly tune-up uh, every Tuesday. That's uh, physical warm-up followed by vocal technique and warm-ups. We also do a 10-minute version of that that people can do every single day. We do some oral skills, we do some sight reading skills, and then we do some uh, repertoire. And quite often the repertoire does have backing tape, a bit like Lynn was suggesting, because actually singing by yourself at home, if you've trained to do that, that's fantastic. But most people join choirs to actually sing with other people. Um, so trying to sort of find a way, and I can't say that we've got the answers to that uh, yet, but sending out different types of repertoire. So we've enjoyed, for example, sending out some music theatre repertoire along with you know, European sacred works as well. So that's something that we send out on every, uh, every week and that's divided amongst the music staff so they don't always just see my head every, every week popping up on their computer. We also do uh, Zoom rehearsals, Death by Zoom, and because we have four different choirs that we're catering to, they're slightly different for each one. Our young adult choir, for example, Vox, they're meeting tonight and they meet in soprano and alto and then tenor and bass and then they have a social event at the end of it. The other choirs at the moment, they're meeting part by part, and say with something like the Festival Chorus, which is made up of about 400 singers, that's really more conceptual learning. So it's an interesting one. As we come out of this, I imagine Zoom rehearsals will be something 
uh, that we will probably keep. It's a very efficient way of rehearsing sectionals, um, particularly if it comes to a Baroque piece where you've got to explain the ideas behind phrasing and things like that. And in a sense, um, it puts some of the personal responsibility back on the singers because, you know, you can just keep saying, you sound wonderful. And, you know, the, the onus is on the singers to realise when they're making their own mistakes. Um, so in, in a sense, as, as, as uh, tantalisingly difficult as Zoom is, in some ways there's been some benefit for it as well. All of this will hopefully lead to a virtual choir uh, that we will produce at the end of this period, which will somehow capture the three pieces that we uh, commissioned for our centenary concert, which was a piece from Deborah Cheatham, a piece from Elena katz Chernan looking at immigration, and a mashup, which essentially was the ten greatest hits of the Philharmonia put together in a rather wacky way um, by Dan Walker. We hope to, to sort of have that as the the end of the journey because our chorus are a performing choir that are used to coming to rehearsals in order to have uh the goal or the satisfaction of performing uh at the at the end of that so that's why they give up all their time to do it but some of the things that have popped up along the way as well is a chance to connect with some of our members who are now overseas and indeed with some of our alumni members so they've been brought back into the fold via technology and actually last night for the first time we did a sectional rehearsal with Matthew Orlovich who also wrote us a new piece for this year with the composer present um, so it's 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 within the restrictions finding creative ways that that can be beneficial both for us musically but also for the singers to engage for example with a composer last night where they had direct access with the composer and I think if I take something away from all of this period so far has been the ability to actually connect with the singers in a way that I don't always get a chance to do in a normal rehearsal period where I have 160 singers in a room rehearsing Beethoven 9 or Mahler, Das Klagen der Lied. I don't have time to go up and talk to each every and every person, but actually in the sectionals, they always start with some sort of interpersonal exchange, and that's been fantastic. So that's essentially what we're doing. We're trying to create some sort of um, journey that the singers can go on and be proud of and look back and say, well, I was part of that at the end of the, of, of the year. Do you think as a conductor, Brett, you're going to miss the Zoom mute button? Uh, La Mutata is actually quite an amazing thing for a conductor, I have to say. So we have, yes, it, it's become an Italian term, La Excellent. Mutata. Now, Paul, uh, Paul Holly, if, if we've got people listening... Uh, in who uh, you know finding finding these sort of online choir experiences um, tricky in any ways? Are there any sort of tips that you have for how you might be able to uh, you know quick fixes or you know, or very you know, little things that will actually make a big difference to people's online experience? Uh, look, I I started being very earnest about what I wanted to achieve uh, and uh, discovered that. Um, a number of the things that both Lynn and Brett have talked about, um, that this opportunity, this time gave us an opportunity to experiment with some different things, um, just as uh, Brett was saying about um, having Matthew work. Well, last night with our youth choir, we had um, Paul Stanhope um, online with them, and that was a great experience for them to meet the composer and to hear about the work um, of Paul's that we'd been doing. Um, the, certainly Lynn's suggestion and Brett's about, um, I found that for my singers, when they were singing along with piano, um, there was quite a change from them straight away as soon as I actually played them a recording. So we did a bit of work on the piece and then I played them a recording and they sang along with and immediately the response from them was, you can see on their face that because they weren't the only voice they could hear, then there was suddenly this sense of actually being part of, of something else, um, which, was, uh, which was very exciting for them. Um, and I, the other things, I guess the other things that I've realised too, and I'll perhaps maybe we might touch on this a little bit later, is there's just a need to... Um, to do some other things um, in our rehearsal as well and to, to break it up. Um, and so that is how they meet at the beginning. Um, it is just some other things that we might would never do in a normal rehearsal, um, but just little things that we've done to help break um, up that, I guess, that, and to really give us that social interaction time, um, which they are missing so much. Um, and so, um, you know, one of our choirs has, we've had... Um, we have a cooking, um, a favourite recipe for the week, you know, that is shared amongst the lovers and things. Um, so just to try and break it up a little bit for them as well and to keep that social um, aspect. Um, but unfortunately, I have no um, extra secrets about... Uh, I have certainly not cracked Zoom um, to work out how you can have an amazing experience <laughs> using that uh, format. So. 
Great. Well, um, let's turn now to the kind of thrust of our, our conversation tonight, which is about the practical considerations. So whenever it is in your particular part of the world that you're able to go back to having choir rehearsals uh, within government and uh, other regulations and advice, um, you'll be wanting to, I, we think that you'll be wanting to make a plan of how to do that. And we thought that we've got this expert panel here who can provide a wealth of ideas. Um, and we know the guidelines are being uh, developed in different stages, or uh, different stages in different states of Australia, for instance. Um, but I think a fairly common one is going to be hygiene. So we're going to start with that one. Then we're going to start with uh, the queen of hygiene, uh, Dr. Melanie Roth. Um, what, what advice would you give, uh, Mel, to uh, you know, the things that we should be doing and planning for? I think with, with hygiene um, and with all ages, really, there is a, a habit that we've all got into that is is not quite to the hygiene requirements that, that COVID-19 requires. And I think people underestimate the impact that careful managing of hygiene has on, on reducing um, the, the spread of this disease. And so as far as risks go, I think if, if hygiene starts as a culture, um, that it's clearly modelled by the people who are in leadership positions in the choir and that you've got a good buy-in. Um, and that involves frequently either sanitising or washing and using the correct technique. And if you don't know about the correct technique, you just Google correct technique of hand washing and it'll, it'll come up. There's a million different posters to choose from. Um, so it's not just the simple hand rub that won't cut it. It's, it's the, the proper technique and I'm not going not gonna to model it now, but it's, you know, between the fingers, the nails, the palms, the back of the hands, et cetera, um, and, and around the thumbs. So that's got to be modelled by the, the people that they're watching. Um, th there is evidence to suggest that the more availability in the more positions of, of hand sanitizer there are, the more frequently people will use it. You won't walk two metres to use it, but if it's right in front of you, you will. Um, and I think it's a really good message to um, try and explain the rationale. And the rationale for hand hygiene is that if before you touch a surface, and that's because the previous surface you may have touched, which might have been your own face or the rail in the train or whatever, may have particle virus on it. And you will then, every time you touch something, you pick things up. Similarly, every time you touch something, you leave things down and you can leave down what you've just picked up. So in order to protect the surfaces and the people you're going to touch, you need to sanitise or wash your hands before you touch it. And in order to protect yourself or the next surface you touch, you need to sanitise and, and, and do your hands after you've touched something. And touch awareness is something you can develop um, I went into town on the train the other day of necessity and I did not touch one surface. It was the only thing I was thinking about. Could I do it without touching a single rail or a single seat cover or a single seat back? Um, and, and you can. I did. Um, and I think that that's sort of, it's almost like the no-touch challenge and it starts to become a habit. Um, so if you explain the sort of the crime scene Thing that really if, if you if you imagine the choir space as a crime scene and you don't want to be leaving your fingerprints or your DNA then you don't touch things and it's kind of a, a good way to think about it I think um, but so that's that's with the hand hygiene um, and obviously hand hygiene would need to be done on arrival um, and then after every really every surface that, that's touched and it's worthwhile thinking about surfaces in terms of things that you're doing. So things that lots of people would routinely touch, but it's not really necessary. It's not really necessary for every chorister to come in and play on the piano before choir starts. It's not necessary for everybody to move everybody else's chairs. Um, it, it's not no, I interrupt. I mean, it's actually never necessary to do that outside of a pandemic at all. So that's an excellent but practice. They, but they do it, and we do it by habit. And children do it particularly. They touch each other. They'll show each other things, um, hand things around to each other, um, share pens. All of those things you do automatically because you've done it forever. So it's really it's good to develop a culture where 
um, people feel free to remind each other. Um, and and so if there's sort of a pact that if I if I tell you you've just touched something, it's not a criticism, it's it's an assistance and a protection for everyone. The other component of the culture, I think, is one of trust where there has to be absolutely no repercussions for somebody who feels remotely unwell to not attend. Um, and that that should be encouraged all the time. It's kind of goes to screening on entry, um, but it's really screening before you even decide to come in. Um, and that can be informal by making it clear that you shouldn't come in if you're caring for somebody who's unwell, if you've been tested, if you feel in any way unwell yourself, um, even if you think you might be feeling unwell tomorrow, don't come in. <laughs> um, we, would, we would encourage that. Um, that really takes the place of asking the questions, whether or not you want to um, consider temperature testing on entry or whether you just want people to know whether they've got a temperature will depend on the sophistication of, of your choristers, I, I would suggest. And the other thing in, in terms of, of uh, culture really is, is the social distancing. And that's possibly the hardest thing because we all get very comfortable with about a one and a half feet um, personal space and some people get to one foot and it feels too close but 1.5 meters is quite a long way and and in a choir setting that's probably the minimum and you should remind people little people this won't work but big people it will work that if you can if you can both stretch out your arms and touch each other you're probably too close and that a mechanism to stop people getting into your get, getting too close, it won't be uncomfortable, but you've got to be aware, needs to become uncomfortable, is you step back, smile on your face, hand up and say, oh, I'm just reminding you, we, we, we might be getting a bit too close here. And the times when it's, it's easy to forget is if you're both looking at something, both concentrating on something, or you're talking in a very animated way as a child and you just automatically get closer and closer, particularly if it's a secret. So those things, um, again, are things that just everyone has to agree that you're all going to remind each other about, I, I would. But no say. secrets in choir? No, secrets everyone has to hear. Right. Good. Um, now, one of the key questions we've been, we've been receiving both in advance uh, of this and throughout the chat uh, that the audience has been able to communicate is about the wearing of masks. Uh, Wei, what, what do you have to say can you talk us through um, how, what are the issues around masks? Yeah, so I think um, in terms of mask wearing, there's there's been a lot of misinformation in the media and it wasn't helped very much by um, an announcement by the US CDC that masks were not, a, were not effective. Um, I think it's very important for everyone to understand that, that masks uh, in this context have a couple of key purposes. And one of them is uh, source control and the other one is prevention of transmission. And they're actually two different things. So if I wear a cloth mask, there is good evidence to say that that actually prevents large droplets from actually uh, going out into the environment and then uh, collecting on surfaces. And, and, you know, it does not need to be a HEPA-filtered HEPA uh, N95 uh, surgical grade mask for that to be effective. There are numerous studies saying that wearing of cloth masks prevents a person who is uh, infected or may be asymptomatic but and doesn't know they're infected from transmitting droplets. Uh, now, all of the confusion around uh, the ineffectiveness of, of masks is around the idea of them as PPE or personal protective equipment. And what the confusion is, is that um, the evidence does not show that cloth masks are effective once uh, the particles uh, are aerosolized and 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 small. Uh, ordinary masks that are not uh, special uh, N95 masks don't prevent some particles that are already expelled into the air from from getting into uh, a person and then breathing it in. So so it's to do with the size of the particles and and I guess. What that means practically is that in, uh, with all of the things that Mel has described, all of the practical considerations around hygiene, it's, it's uh, absolutely um, a consideration at, that masks, if worn by singers 
and conductors and essentially worn by, by everybody in a room uh, would be effective at uh, controlling droplet expulsion. Um, and so essentially you're protecting yourself and any choristers who might be, uh, I guess, asymptomatic um, and may not have a temperature, but maybe carrying uh, a virus, not just COVID-19, but, but other viruses too, from, from actually transmitting this uh, out. So, so masks are definitely uh, a consideration that should be used uh, in conjunction with all of the other hygiene me measures that are already mentioned. Lynn. Um, what about the issue, Way, of when you, breathe, when you breathe while you're singing, you need to take a lot of air in quickly. Yes. And actually, it's quite hard to breathe properly and deeply with a mask. And so, therefore, it's not going to make it very tiring. And, you know, potentially, you know, we have enough people fainting in choir rehearsals. Well, we don't, yes. but we, every now and yes. again, we do. <laughs> but it's not ideal. Um, yeah. you know, if you don't remind well, them to stop moving and think, that's, it's just a thing that I, because children can forget to breathe and yes. they faint. Uh, yes. So. Yeah, look, Lynn, I'm not suggesting that everyone should wear a mask for all rehearsals. I guess it's, it's a practical consideration. Um, I think, I think that definitely it can be very difficult with to breathe with a mask on and certainly from wearing masks, uh, you know, routinely at work, um, there are lots of things that can happen to your face when you leave a mask on and you don't touch your face. Um, you know, you can get all sorts of, kind of pressure injuries and things. Um, I, I think the answer to that is that um, people, so, when you give people the opportunity to, to acquire or make their own mask, there are going to be lots of different variables, uh, variable types of masks and materials that people explore and use. And so you, you don't really have control over, I guess, um, what people will wear, but perhaps if one is considering wearing a mask, uh, giving people the option to, to test what works for them might be a good practical solution to this. So obviously if you put a mask on and you try and sing and you try and breathe and you just find it doesn't work, um, then it wouldn't be something that would, would work for you. But maybe some uh, materials and, and some masks may work better for some singers and others. And of course, with people who have under, underlying respiratory issues um, and, you know, would not cope with wearing a mask while singing, then, you know, that needs to be a consideration for them as well. Um, so, yes, I, I don't think there's a perfect answer to that question, but the individualising um, masks for people and allowing them to work out work, what works for them in a singing uh, context would, would be helpful. So, Lynn, we know that uh, one of the compulsory subjects in all choral conducting degrees is how to set up chairs. In fact, that's all we do, isn't it, as choral conductors, just setting up chairs for the rest of our lives. Can you talk us through uh, very, very practical, simple things about your about people's rehearsal rooms as they're thinking? Because I guess what, what people want to do is think it through how they're going to be doing their first rehearsal if, you know, when they're allowed to go back. What would you do? Well, certainly what we're considering um, at Gondwana is looking into, even before you get into the rehearsal room, how is everybody going to get in there and making sure that everyone knows in advance that it's going to be a whole new process. And having the chairs set up, uh, we saw that um, those choirs rehearsing in, in Europe, the the Berlin Radio Choir and very, very distant. You know, they're taking that precautious approach of what singing might do and that, you know, the one and a half metres might not be enough for singers, especially uh, more mature singers. And um, so that, that distancing is really important. And also the least, not just from side to side, but in front, because, of course, you know, the droplets are going straight to the person in front and then all they're all going towards the conductor so you know the conductor's standing a lot further back than they normally would and probably in a lot more more disciplined way I tend to move around and come right up to the choristers all the time and everything and it's we're going to have to stay a long way back and um, you know work out how to protect ourselves as conductors, um, but just keeping the, the paths clear, the entrance way so they can all stay separate, maybe cancelling the 
breaks, so having a shorter session, keeping it shorter, because that also reduces risk of those aerosols affecting people. Um, and then keeping, as we said, things like the piano reserved for the pianist and within that um, the setup of the room, really being very careful of ventilation. I don't think it's practical for us necessarily all across Australia to all be rehearsing outside, but actually other rehearsal rooms that we're using of the appropriate size to allow, you know, more than your four square metres almost, and um, are they adequately ventilated so that new air is coming in all the time um, would be the thoughts that we're having uh, so far in that particular department. And, and Brett, what, yes, Brett, what, 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 what are you, your thoughts? For Actually, just before I, I pop into that, I was just wondering, is tiered seating anything that choirs should be looking at? Is the fact that we tend to all sit on exactly the same level, is there any advantage to being in tiers? But from the discussion last week, possibly not. But I was just curious about that as a question. I think it's more about the distancing. Um, I think the, the trajectory of droplets uh, would, would not wouldn't make a, a difference if you can visualise the way droplets might fall in a tiered mm. seating arrangement. Um, it's much more about separating people so that yeah they don't come in into within that radius that Mel was talking about before. Yeah. Well, certainly from our point of view, it's it's feeling like it's still a bit too early uh, for us to come back. Uh, at this stage, naturally. But one of the things we are exploring, of course, is how can we make the Zoom sessions more satisfying? So in the first instant, probably what we will end up doing is having four singers in a room individually mic'd with a camera so that we do actually have some semblance of a choral rehearsal happening. And that way we can distance singers, we can uh, target individual parts, but we can collectively bring it together. But it's not a recording. It is something live and it is something a little bit dangerous. And it is something dangerous in a good way, sorry, musical way sorry not not a health way uh and it's something where you know you can actually demonstrate how you can fix something uh so you do have a model in which you can uh, you can work with but naturally rehearsals will be much shorter and you know if you take the zoom sort of uh experience as a as a guide you can get an awful lot done in 45 minutes even with the meet and greet at the beginning and warm up you can cover quite a lot. Of course, in the Zoom sessions, I've only been doing pieces that are three or four minutes long. How that will translate to doing something like a Mozart Requiem or a Mrs. Lemnus by Beethoven will be a, be a real challenge. But therefore, uh, with adult choirs, I think one of the things that will be interesting is really talking to your choristers about what they're available for. One of the things that I'm very excited about is, let's say we have our huge symphony chorus of 120, 160 singers. Which of them can come in the morning? Which of them can come in the afternoon? Which can come in the evening? And you actually end up rehearsing small subsets of the choir in, say, 25, 40, groups, uh, 40 people in a group. And that way you actually get to know the individual voices even better than you thought you did before. Um, so it's actually a very effective way. They're shorter, they're smaller groups, they're more frequent throughout the day. Um, and so you, as a conductor, you will end up behind a mask with much better... Uh, sort of, um, what's the word, uh, interaction with your, with your singers. We are looking at some sort of outdoor experience because in winter we can't rehearse at night. So there is a possibility that we could bring the choir together, even for more social sort of ideas um, in, in places like around the city. If you go into Hunter Street in Sydney, the Deutsche Bank is a big open air space, but it's somewhat... Can, it can actually contain sound in a sense, but it's fantastic ventilation. The ventilation thing for us will be a real challenge because no matter what size of choir we have and what room we're in, it is always different for different people. Some people will find it too cold, some people will find it too hot. Um, and everyone is, is quite different uh, when it comes to that. So the ventilation for us will actually be a real challenge, I have to say, um, particularly listening to some of the comments from last week. Talking about the humming choir uh, sort of idea, though, uh, thank you, Puccini, um, I do keep coming back in, in my head to something that Robert Shaw said, which is this idea of don't waste vocal gold in rehearsal. So actually, rehearsals could actually be about singing softer and more listening, uh, and, and known as the, the diction person, uh, you know, they might, there may be a, 
a couple of less fricatives um, happening in rehearsals as well. But certainly using our time together to open our ears and enjoy harmony. And then there will be room for Zoom, I should imagine. Uh, we can probably not have to bring the choir together for sectionals. So think, as chor chorus masters, I think we need to think, what are the actual rehearsals really for when we come together? But what can we actually do away from that rehearsal in a sectional situation? Because the technology is there. It's not that hard. With older members of the choir, we may just have to find ways of coming into their house and, and helping them with the technology um, as well. The, part of the problem with the technology is everybody has a different computer sitting in front of them of a different age and different capabilities. I think that's one of the things that we're really finding. Um, not everyone has a brand spanking new Apple computer that can do everything. With, with fantastic sound. Um, but that's how I imagine we'll work with some sort of rostering system with the singers as well, so everyone gets a chance to actually meet in person at some point. But in terms of the attendance, yes, I think as conductors we will get used to the fact for at least the next 12 months, but maybe forever, we do film every single rehearsal. If you are not well, you stay at home, but you can still attend the rehearsal because I think that's one of the, the things with adult choirs, that they are aware of missing chunks of the rehearsal period if they are away and we all know as a group we rehearse as a group so uh, one person being away does affect the rest of the group when they come back so I think for chorus masters that's a bit of a win-win okay well you can't come into rehearsal and that's your personal choice so we probably throw away our attendance policy and make it much more again about personal responsibility but in a sense that could actually be one of the best things that that ever happened um, because that person is still learning and then you have a record of that rehearsal so okay well you might have been on a plane well you're not going to be on a plane but you might be somewhere um, and at least there's that document there well you've got to make sure you've seen this rehearsal before you come back to rehearsal next week so I think you know opening it up and starting to think about those things we are also thinking of even virtual re-auditions so you know our, our singers sometimes have to travel up to an hour two hours to come in to do a 15 minute audition we are all starting to embrace this technology. There are ways that we could actually re-audition the choir and make it quite effective um, through an electronic means. So for me, it's actually you know, a tremendous opportunity to rethink everything, um, but shorter and more frequent is probably what we'll end up doing. Right, what I'm hearing there is by, by filming every rehearsal, uh, you're confessing that you'll actually never need to answer the same question twice. What can I possibly say? I'm not going to answer that question, Sam. Paul oh, Holly, how, well, um, we've talked a little bit about um, what we'll be doing in, re in the rehearsal room and how we might be structuring our rehearsals, but presumably around all of this, people are, wanting, are going to want to be thinking about how they're communicating with their choirs and the mm -hmm. choristers and their families, if they're working with young people, those sorts of things. What are you thinking about in that area? Mm, absolutely. And I think uh, we are, I'm certainly discovering um, with Bira Lee that uh, I have to... There's a, I'm discovering all of the things that I used to just take for granted and realising now that there are a number of those things that will need to be addressed um, and that I have to, you know, th to be able to communicate really clearly to our members and in our case, because we're predominantly working with children, it's of course communicating with the parents as well because it's actually them who are probably more interested in knowing the, what it is that we're putting in place. Um, so I'm, we're certainly looking at how we can go about making um, the expectations as clear as possible, um, as well as the risk assessment that we've done and how we've tried to address these things so that, um, so that there is as much ease as possible I know that there will be members who are reticent to, even if we say we're going to start having rehearsals again, there will be members who are reticent to come. Um, that gives us something, to, a different scenario to deal with as well, um, is how we do, and, and, and Brett's just talked about some of the ways we might go around, uh, get around that. There's also the possibility that there will be those who won't, who won't feel comfortable to return. And so what, what do we, you know, how are we managing that as well for those people? Um, um, I think there's quite a few, you know, we're looking at things on a very practical level. How do we manage, for example, um, the parents who normally come to rehearsal, we have a waiting room that they usually sit in while the rehearsal is happening. You know, um, that's not really going to be practical now. Um, the space is not big enough for have, to have parents in. Um, how are we going to look at that kind of idea? What, what happens? How do we manage that? Um, one of the things that I'm really conscious of because of the need for us to be social distancing, one of the things we're going to, have to be really careful about managing and then, of course, communicating is that um, 
we will possibly ha be having to use new venues um, to have these rehearsals when they do happen. It might be uh, somewhere new. And I actually have this feeling that for choirs, it's, that's going to be a little bit problematic, um, particularly for larger ensembles, uh, who will need to take up quite a lot of space to be able to socially distance if they're going to have their choir of 50 people together. Um, and so, you know, what venues are going to be available and what, uh, what chance is there of us being able to use these venues um, in order to be able to have our rehearsals. So there's a number of things that, that I think, you know, as I said, when we're so used to working in a particular space um, that have just come to the forefront. I know that one of the things for our, you know, that so often for the chorus and my choristers, both the younger ones and the ones, you know, who are in their late 20s, um, just it'll be interesting to set those, those um, to be able to communicate those expectations that Mel was talking about earlier, you know, because I know a bunch of them, their first reaction is to hug each other when they arrive at choir, to hug the conductor if they're some of the little ones who just run into piccolos, the five-year-olds, and hug the conductor and hug the accompanist and hug each other and all of that kind of stuff, you know. Um, that's going to be quite tricky to how, how we communicate these with all of our members at different at different um, levels, but um, it's certainly going to be something that we have to think about. Um, perhaps we will be having um, a Zoom session for families of each group before they actually come together uh, to be able to rehearse for the first time. That explains to families how things are going to work. Um, we may have to create, um, if some of our children are going to be, in my case, children are going to be rehearsing in different spaces, you know, I may have to create a video that walks them through what they're going to have to do when they arrive the first time and say, this is where you'll come from, the, you know, et cetera, all of those kinds of things that, again, we've never really had to think about before. But I think there's a whole lot of areas there that we'll have to contemplate as well. So Dr. Megan Kalusi has been sitting there very patiently and it seems an appropriate moment to, to ask a senior lecturer in uh, psychiatry how to stop choristers hugging. <laughs> kind of um, how we will go about the uh, mental health and all sorts of other implications, addressing those in our choirs um, as we consider returning uh, to rehearsals. What do you think? Well, I think that, I mean, from the conversations I've had over the last week with choristers, with parents, with conductors, with school teachers, uh, that there uh, for the first point would be that there's a huge amount of enthusiasm for getting back to choir. Uh, you know, everybody is absolutely committed to that aim, which is very um, encouraging. But there is a lot of anxiety out there uh, amongst choristers and amongst uh, parents of choristers, and uh, you know, a very a great sense of responsibility amongst organisers of choirs and conductors to ensure that they are providing a safe and uh, 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 and yet productive choir experience for students uh, and for choristers of all ages. Um, I guess I suppose my first point would be just in terms of what the sort of problems we might anticipate in terms of students coming back to choir. Uh, and I would say that for the majority of students in terms of their well-being, their mental health, it's probably not going to be a major issue for them. They're going to be delighted to come back when they can come back. And they're a resilient and strong and generally happy group of kids who will just get on with it, I think. So that's the first point. Um, the problem is, as you say, stopping them from jumping in each other's arms and uh, immediately <laughs> uh, losing all social distancing. And I guess the other thing we know about choristers is that they're also a disciplined lot on the whole. And I think we'll have to really uh, make the most of that. And it becomes part of their practice and they're very good at learning new things. And that's one of the things they're going to have to learn if they're going to come back to choir. And that needs to be made very clear to all choristers. And uh, uh, I have no doubt that they have great capacity to learn new behaviours because I've seen them do it over the years so many times. They're brilliant at learning and um, uh, both older choir members and younger ones. So 
it's going to be a bit tricky. There'll probably be a few dodgy moments, but I suspect that they will come to that quite well. Um, the, I think the, I suppose the, some of the issues that I'm hearing about are uh, parents who are concerned that insufficient care is being taken and wanting particularly the medical doctors, parents I'm talking to, um, that that everything is being done as it should be. And I think that the key to that is going to be communication and uh, ensuring that parents and children understand that all care and consideration has been taken and that protocols are in place and, and very careful thinking has been undertaken about how to do this as safely as possible, taking into account all the best possible advice from the uh, uh, key professionals from wherever you happen to be in whatever part of whatever country you happen to be. I mean, in Australia, each area of Australia does things differently. And even within areas of Australia, your choir is different to every other choir, depending on how many students you have, how many participants you have, what their age ranges are, uh, what particular needs they have. Um, and so the needs of your choir need to be taken into account. So that again comes down to good communication with your choir, making sure you can get feedback about what their issues and concerns are and having capacity to address those. And I think the other key thing that has already come up is flexibility. I mean, this crisis has seen enormous change coming about in everybody's lives in a terribly rapid um, period of time. And a lot of that change has actually been amazing and fantastic. And as we're hearing, it's gonna be enduring. We're, we're doing things that would have taken years to bring about and we've done them in months. And some very exciting innovations that we've seen, um, certainly in mental health, uh, physical health care and I'm seeing I've heard about some terribly exciting things happening in choirs but we've also heard that some kids and some adults some choristers are dealing with these changes better than others um, and we know we're beginning to see and certainly the projections are that we're going to see a lot of mental health problems coming out emerging um, in the next few months. So we're likely to see a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, um, a lot of sleep problems, uh, the calls to uh, an emergency mental health lines have escalated extraordinarily. Um, and uh, that is likely to be reflected in our population of choristers as well. And we know that kids or adults who already have existing mental health problems their problems are likely to have been exacerbated by these problem by COVID-19 as well. So we we will have a population of choristers who will have, um, uh, you know, who may be more anxious than usual, who may be more stressed than usual. There may be choristers who have lost their jobs and are under mm. enormous financial stress, um, uh, or whose parents have lost their jobs. Uh, so we have. I mean, the unusual thing about this particular crisis is not just one person who is in, under crisis, it's the whole family and, in fact, the whole society, the whole community. It's nobody who hasn't been touched by this. Um, so uh, we know that there will be people under enormous amounts of stress and that may come out in choir as unusual behaviours. It might come out as kids perhaps who've been anxious before, being more anxious coming back to choir now um, and needing more levels well, of mean, TNC. Quite, I mean, that'll, that'll be the test really to determine uh, regular unusual behaviour and unusual unusual behaviour. That's right, um, yes. So, <laughs> There's I mean, always been a bit of that, yeah. Yes, <laughs> that, that's a challenge. And, 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 I, and I suppose for everyone listening that, that there's, uh, for as many choirs where choristers will be really wanting to hug each other, there'll be just as many choirs who will be very good at social distance. That's right, that's and right. Get, and get, yeah. keeping their distance. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, let's, we've, we've got a few minutes remaining and I think what would be really helpful um, to kind of bring all of what we've been talking about together um, is, is basically, you know, if you're a choral conductor listening to this webinar, uh, how are you going to go about bringing all of this together? And something that strikes me, and maybe, uh, Mel, you could speak to this a little bit, 
is that obviously we're in an incredibly high risk situation at the moment, but uh, in terms of contemplating re returning, I mean, we, we didn't come from a zero risk position um, in the first place, even before, before this pandemic. Uh, and so sort of chasing a zero risk um, is sort of ch uh, chasing something that doesn't really exist. Um, Mel, how would you go about um, putting together, you know, a risk management or minimisation strategy? I think risk, risk management is, is two things. It's individuals undertaking their own risk management. And obviously that will depend on their own vulnerabilities, their own position. There are people who are desperately worried about elderly parents living at home or um, people they know or are close to with, with various health conditions um, that they may even not want to disclose. So there will be people making their own individual risk decisions that's not necessarily based only on, on their own um, risk aversion. But then there is the collective risk assessment and that is going to have to be dynamic. So that's going to have to take into account um, the, the current prevalence or the, the, the whether or not you're in a place that's got a cluster of cases. Um, there are countries where clearly that's, that's the case currently really throughout the countries and there are places where there may only be a few locations and that's obviously going to change. So if you're in a, in a community that's currently got some sort of cluster or outbreak, you may decide that you want to do less of it in person and more of it um, online. And, and as that changes over the next few weeks, you, you, would, you would change that. And uh, it would also depend on the risks associated with your individual choristers. So, um, and there needs to be a tolerance of that. I think that, that the expectations of attendance and choirs needs to be um, compassionate and needs to realise that people may not come for reasons that, that are not the reason they give you. Um, and um, likewise, if there are, are breaches, and I, I know we were just talking about children coming in and wanting to hug the conductor. Well, if they're hugging you around the legs um, and you're not actually touching them, um, it's less of a risk to you than, you know, choristers who hug each other and kiss each other on the face or, or more. Um, but, but I think initially, while people get used to it, there's going to be um, a bit of jumping on that and the potential for almost a bullying um, so that, that when we're being aware of it and reminding each other, that needs to not be accusatory, that needs to be amusing or kind. Um, because those little things, the, the culture of your choir and how that develops and, and the, um, the habits of the people, which does, does vary from country to country, even how, how emotional and how, um, how huggy people are with each other, that, that those things need to be taken into account really on a choir by choir um, and maybe age group by age group basis. I think that, that's really helpful because it really sums up what we've been talking about tonight in that it's um, the thing that I, I certainly felt, the thing that we all wanted from last week's webinar was the rules and regulations. We wanted to know how many extra square metres you needed to, for, for singers uh, in your rehearsal room. Uh, you know, you wanted to know you could rehearse for 43 minutes in, and as long as the ceiling height was 15.7 metres high, it would all be fine. Um, it's pretty clear that that doesn't exist. Um, I, I think I'm right in, in, in saying those sorts of things. And so I guess for the choral community listening, it's about, um, it's about, bringing, about actually having to make those sorts of decisions in your context. Um, and that's, that's quite a brave thing to do. And, and I suppose uh, one of the great things about tonight and bringing together choral conductors is that we sort of know that we're all in it together. Are there any final thoughts from the panel people would like to share? I can't believe a room of conductors is silent. That's never happened. Outrageous. Well, well. Um, I mean, the other the other thing that you might like to do is is jump online next week and hear the incredibly inspiring Simon Halsey, uh, who is who can light up any sort of room, uh, no matter how tall it is, no matter how online it is, uh, with his tales of of his choral life. Uh, and it's a thing that's intended for all age groups. Um, so young people, anyone interested in choirs, uh, if, you, if you sing in choirs, if you like listening to them, come and hear a world expert 
Um, and Godman is also really pleased to be offering uh, a professional development um, stream for coral conductors, which is NESA accredited uh, here in Australia. Um, so jump online and find out about those sorts of things. As you're planning your first rehearsal, you might um, want an extra dose of coral inspiration. So it, all that remains for me to do is to thank our wonderful panel. We couldn't ask for a nicer uh, group of people uh, to talk about these issues with. Um, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you for joining us from all across Australia and all around the world. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you.